we're sorry we had to pull you out of uh, Kids Fest, but this is some pretty exciting things that's happening here. We wanted you guys to be a part of this, all right? You see your mama up there? Are you proud of your mama? We are too. We can't wait to see what God will do in your life. It's been a joy to be able to kind of talk with you and to share the things of God in your life over the last several weeks and even months as we've talked about what it is that God is doing that has led you to this experience. I know that being a disciple of Jesus is never easy, but God has promised you you'll never be alone. The decision that you make today forever invites God to be a part of your life. Susan, he has promised he will never leave you or forsake you. I have a verse of scripture that I want to share with you as you are baptized this morning. And here's what it says. It's Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above and not on the things of earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Susan, because you have given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, it is our privilege this morning to baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, for the remission and forgiveness of all of your sins, and now for a brand new life in Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you. Well, Beverly brought her own cheering section this morning. She's surrounded by friends and family that love her, support her, that are celebrating what God is doing in your life. This is one of those family moments. Not just this family, but the family of God. And we recognize that. Guys, we want to make sure that we uh, do not obscure the cameras because we're streaming this and recording this and we want to be able to share it with as far and as wide as we can. But we're glad, Beverly, that God has led you to our church family. We're excited about not only the journey that you have had with God up to this point, but where God will lead from this day forward. The best days for God's people are ahead of us. I can't say the best days for this world is ahead of it, but we're not of this world. We're in this world, but we are not called to be of this world. We are of a heavenly kingdom. And so, Beverly, I have a verse that I wanted to share with you this morning as you are baptized. It comes from Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. It says this, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Beverly, today, because you have rededicated your life to Jesus, it is our privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit, for the remission and forgiveness of all of your sins, and for a brand new life in Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you, Beverly. Thank you, Shauna. It was one year ago today that I stood before the congregation and shared a burden that I had on my heart, and it was that we as the people of God, particularly the Adventist people, do Sabbath well. Don't we? Isn't Sabbath a blessing? Isn't it, you know, it doesn't matter what you've had going on all week long. God knew what he was doing by giving us this time, 
this memorial, this place in time where we can come and get our compass fixed sometimes and to just renew our commitment to him and to spend that time. And so we come to church and we read the Bible and we go into Sabbath school class and we learn more about Jesus and we come to church and we worship and we experience all the great things of God. And if every day was Sabbath, just imagine where you would be spiritually. You know, I've heard people say that, Pastor, if every day was Sabbath, I'd be okay. The problem is Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And we said, look, that's There's no reason you can't experience God's power and God's presence every day of the week. And so we began a journey together. We said, look, God doesn't just want to do Sabbath with you. He wants to do life with you. Every day, God wants to connect with you. Every day, God has something to share with you. Every day, God wants to pour his love upon you and for you to experience the fullness of God. And one of the best ways God does that is through his word. You want to be close to Jesus? At any time, at any place. Yes, he's only a prayer away. But open his word. and Let it wash over you. Powerful. So we introduced a reading plan where we would read together as a church family all the way through the Bible. And we're coming down to just the last few weeks. And it's been wonderful. We've seen transformation take place. John 17 talks about thy word is truth. Sanctify them through the word is what it says. God, you want to be holy? You want to be more like God? The Word of God is what does that. It's God's power in your life. So we've invited our church family every day to take a portion of Scripture and read it. And we'd read the same thing. And once a week in our life groups, we would come together and we would share how God has spoken to us. The purpose of, of reading or doing life together and reading through the Bible wasn't to learn all the dates and places and facts and, and history, but through all of that, to hear God speak to our own hearts. What do I need to hear from God today? And God has done that. God has done that. And so on Wednesday evenings, we come together and we share as a, as a small group what God has done. And it's been powerful. For those who have taken the challenge, amazing things have happened. And I want you to know as a pastor, this is not the end. This is the end of year one. But this is exactly what we're going to do next year. You see, because we're not called to just make believers. It's in some ways easy to believe on Jesus. It's it's hearing the story and allowing yourself to respond and entering into that experience of salvation. But then God calls you to be a disciple. And that's where the difficulty sometimes comes. Of How do I now begin to live this new life? How do I... Now, begin to live every day this new life that God has given to me. It's called being a disciple, and that is where the rubber meets the road. You see, a Christian is not just defined by what we believe. It's by what we do and who we follow. That's what it means to be a Christian, a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And so I want to encourage the church family here today that starting January, we're going to start all over again. And maybe, maybe you've been kind of watching what's been happening from the sidelines going, well, maybe next time. This is it. This is your chance. I didn't plan this with anyone, but I'm wondering, is there someone that has gone through the experience of doing life together, that you have been reading the Word of God, and you've You've come together on a regular basis with your life group and you've experienced the power of God 
in, in a very significant way. Is there anybody like that that would be willing to just share a word this morning? Just as a word of encouragement to others that are maybe trying to find their way, is there one or two like that? Larry, we got a microphone. No preaching, Larry. You got your preaching suit on. We're just talking about we're just talking about how God has worked in your life through that experience. All right. Um, first off, I'd like to ask everyone in here a question, but just answer it to yourself. Have you ever read through the whole Bible? Most of us haven't. But if you want a true closer relationship with Jesus Christ, you have to read all of the Bible from the beginning to the end. The more times you read it, the more you grow in Christ. He is so loving that, that you, everybody wants to be blessed. Everybody wants things to be better. Well, the only way is to allow Christ to come in and live in your heart. And the only way is through hearing his word. Hearing grows your faith. Faith, faith, faith. And it grows as a gift from God. And if you're not in a relationship with him daily, reading his word daily, it will change your life dramatically. Has your life been changed this year? Oh, my life has tremendously been changed. And what you get when you come to these groups, you get input. Sometimes you, you, you read and you get what the Holy Spirit is teaching you. But then when you come and you hear seven or eight other people shine more light on those readings, it's just unbelievable. Amen. So if anyone's complaining that they don't have enough Christ in them, then it's your own fault. You've got to read his word. Thank you for that. God bless you. If anybody's qualified, it's Larry. In our, in our, in our, he's, he, he's part of my small group. Uh, we've been talking about having a celebration at the end of the year for those that were here every night. And, and by the way, even though we've done a lot of things in our schedule, We've done evangelistic meetings and, and other things. Our life group has continued to meet every time. I don't think we've ever canceled. So when we're doing an evangelistic meeting, people are coming here five nights a week. Our life group came six because they did not want to miss that experience. But I think Larry is the one that has been here for every single night. At least we think so because all of us have missed. And so we're, we're not sure he was there all the time, but we, we're pretty sure that he has. Is there one more? One more that would, I, Joyce, I got I to gotta get Joyce. She doesn't, she, she, she tells us in our life group, I don't talk much, but that doesn't mean that I'm not learning and experiencing. She's a writer. How many journals? Four. Four journal, four life journals that she has filled with thoughts that God has given to her. And they're there as a reminder of how God has worked in your life. Well, um. I started coming to life group last year, like you said, and I don't like doing this up front because I start crying. Just look at me. <laughs> just look at me. Don't just ignore them. They're not um, even here. But it has changed my heart. I find myself getting up four o'clock in the morning to study and to read. Um, I go to. I find myself going to work and telling others about Jesus, which I never did that before. And. I like the readings. I like my group. I like I like listening more than talking. I'm not much for talking. I love to hear Charmaine talk because she's just got it together where I hope one day I will get it just like that. But I just love, I love everything we talk about in, in, in the lessons or in the readings. And I, I love I just feel different. I don't know how to explain it, but my heart feels different. And I just love the Lord. And I want to be there with him. I know you do. So that's it. All right. Thank you for that. I know that was hard for her. 
well, you'll be hearing more, and we're going to be rolling out more about what our life group offerings will be. We'll still have a significant number of groups on Wednesday, but we are looking at a Sabbath school class that would be a doing life together, and then maybe one at a different time for those that can't be here on Wednesday. And we're even toying with a one on, I've done one in another church by phone. It's, it wouldn't be the same. Is that true, Joyce? It wouldn't be the same, but it's still better than nothing. And so I want you to have this experience. I want you to be more than an attender of a church. I want you to grow in Jesus. Because if you're not growing, you're dying. That's what you need to understand. It, there's, there's, there's no coasting when it comes to Jesus. Because the world is prosecuting you know, it, everything it can to, to, to pull you back. And you have to make an intentional decision to give yourself to Jesus. It doesn't happen by accident. It happens as a result of saying, this is important in my life. Now, that doesn't mean you've got to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, unless that's the only time you have. And so God bless, as, uh, God bless us as we endeavor to do this. So you're, you're going to be hearing more about that. And, of course, the best part of doing life together is as you're reading all week long, as you come on Sabbath morning, guess what the preacher is going to preach about? Something we read this week. So Matthew chapter 26. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get in. I'm, I'll, I'll get some more testimonies later about doing life together. But Matthew chapter 26. We came across a story, and this is one of the rare stories in the Gospels that are recorded in all of them. But, and that, not much does that. I mean, as you think about the different stories, one or two writers, but here is one that was so powerful that it's recorded in, in the other Gospels as well. And in Jesus' words, it's a story of a woman that comes to him and does something so awesome that it is recorded as a memorial to her and to what she did. It's in Matthew chapter 26, and it's in verse 6 that I'll read to you. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. And when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, and here his words are coming to pass, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. This morning, I want to talk to you about loving Jesus, loving him more and loving him better. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time that we have. I know our time is short, but we believe in the power of your word. We have come here because we love you. We have come here because we want to love you. And now I pray that something we will learn will help us to do that better, deeper, more completely. For we ask it in Jesus' name. When you're reading a story like this and you have it in other places, it's probably a good idea to read what everybody has to say and a clearer picture emerges. But I cannot help but to notice that as you read the others, some felt that it was important to give you the backstory on who this woman was. In fact, the other writers would suggest that this woman that is unnamed, that broke this alabaster flask of fragrant oil and offered it as an act of worship to Jesus, she had a past. She had a past. That's what it says. She had a past. Matthew didn't mention it. And I think that's telling. I think it's important 
sometimes that we need to be reminded that our past doesn't matter sometimes. I, I, I don't want to belittle the life we live before we come to Jesus because, you know, we should guard ourselves and as, as parents and as adults help our children to avoid some of the pitfalls because even though we know that when they come to themselves, when they want to give their life to Jesus, He, he has it covered. He can take care of all that. He can forgive that. But they will always carry it. They will always remember it. I remember what a sinful life is like. I remember doing that. I remember the feelings, and I remember all of that, and I wish I didn't. I wish I didn't. And so even though there's forgiveness and there's cleansing and all of that, and I praise God for that, I think it's best when we avoid it. But this woman had a past that came to Jesus that day. She was a sinful woman. That's what it, it's talking about. But Matthew chooses, when he is going to tell this story, when he is going to create, as it were, this memorial that Jesus said would be told of this woman wherever the gospel is preached, I think by omitting it, what he is telling us is that our past does not matter when it comes to worshiping and loving Jesus. That's who we are as a body. That's who we are as a church. The past doesn't matter. Some of you may say today, as you came through the doors, I come with a past. I am a sinner. I say, welcome to the crowd. Welcome to the club. It's who we are. We don't wear it as a badge, no. But it's who we are. We all have that experience. You might feel that you're alone, but you're not. I remember the first time I walked into a church. My thought was, these people are holy. Now, some of you have been around the Adventist church a long time. You laugh because you know better. But that's the way it was when I came in from that worldly experience to the church. And I looked around and I said, these people are holy. I don't belong here. I don't belong here. And it didn't take very long for me to figure out they weren't as holy as I thought they were. But they were holy. Because God declared them to be holy. And so he is with us. You see, sometimes when we approach the worship of our God, we feel unworthy. And we think that until we do feel worthy, we cannot worship in the right way. And I say, that's upside down, inside out, and backwards. The moment you come into church feeling you're worthy to worship Jesus is probably the day when you're not worthy to worship Him. Jesus told another story about two men that go into the temple to pray. And we know what it's like when our heart is lifted up and we begin to look at our good life and think, God's pretty lucky to have me on his team. Your past doesn't matter. I want you to know this morning that it doesn't matter. So therefore, it should not prevent you from loving Jesus with all your heart. It shouldn't prevent you from worshiping him and loving Him, and serving Him. Don't let your past hold you back. Everywhere else, your past is a predictor of your future. Not here. Not when it comes to Jesus. Past isn't who you are. Well, very quickly, three things that I want to share with you about loving Jesus more. Here's what we learn in this story. Number one, He is worth the very best you have to give. Can you say amen to that? And you might think I'm getting ready to launch into a stewardship sermon, and I could, and it would be fitting to do that, but not today. This is not about your money. Actually, it is, but it's about a whole lot more than your money. It's about everything. There there sometimes is this, this attitude of, mediocrity that we bring to life. We tend to want the easy way of life. We tend to 
go the path of least resistance. Whatever's easy, that's what we do. And when we bring that attitude into the church of the living God, as it relates to our worship, it will never be good enough. What you need to understand is that the object of our worship is a holy, powerful God, a loving God. And he deserves the best that we have. The absolute best. Now, apparently this woman, whether it was ill-gotten gains or not, was a woman of influence. She had resources. The Bible tells us that this, this, this flask that she brought and she broke in the worship of her God, in the expression of her love, she lavished herself upon Jesus. That ointment, well, probably was somewhere around $20,000. 300 denarii. That's what it would be today. Uh, about $20,000. Guys, aren't you lucky that when you go into those stores in a few weeks, you know what I'm talking about. They have those things up near the door for a reason. You got to, you got to, it's like a minefield. And, and, the, and, the, and the merchants don't stay behind the counters. They get in front of the counters. And, and you can't even walk into a store. You know, I, I think they probably say, all right, guys, girls, whoever it is, it's Christmas seasons, and those guys don't have a clue what to get their wives, what to get their girlfriends. We can help them and serve them, and so you have to sometimes run the gauntlet. And I've looked at some of those. They're pretty pricey, uh, pretty pricey, but I've never seen anything that would come close to this. $20,000 or so. That's what she, she had it. She had it. It was within her means to offer that. It was obviously something that she had treasured. It was something that she had bought probably for herself and, and, and thought, you know, at some point I'm going to use it. I don't know how you could ever go to an important enough occasion to use that. But when she heard Jesus was going to be there, she wanted to give it to him. Why did she do it? Because Jesus deserves the best that you have. He deserves the best. Stop offering him what's less than your best. He knows. He knows what it is. He's not saying that we all got to go out there and do something beyond our means, but He knows what we're capable of. He knows the kind of service that we can offer. He knows the gifts that we can give. He knows what is our best. And I would suggest to you that when we offer anything less than that, it is not noteworthy. It's not going to be a memorial for you. You know, the Old Testament, as we've read that together, if it taught us anything at all, that sacrificial system, our offerings reflect our heart. We cannot take what's less than the very best and offer it up to God, and God will be pleased with it. You and I, as disciples of Jesus, need to give Him the best. And yes, that includes finances, but it also includes the best part of the day the best part of your talents, all that you have, carve out the best. You know what often the church gets? The rest. Not the best. We do this, we do that, we do this. People tell me all the time when it comes to finances, I, don't, I can't afford to pay my tithe. I don't, it's just not there. After I've taken care of everything else, nothing is less. Nothing is left. Bingo. I just stare at them. It looked a blank look. And if sometimes they get it. Because the tithe is not just 10, 10%. It's the first 10%. One of the things that I do, and I think our treasurer can bear it out, she probably knows what day I get paid. That very day, I go online, and I want to do that first. Because if I wait until everything else, and my life is such that, no, I'm not going to run out. But it's not the same. It is not the first fruits. And again, I'm not just talking about finance. I'm talking about your service. 
I'm talking about a woman that's willing to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to open up the Word of God because that's the best that she has to offer to Jesus. God is honored in that. I want to encourage you. Don't give the rest. Give the best. Here's the second thing. He's worth any criticism that you will receive. Here's what, I, what I've learned. Is when you put Jesus first life, when you are willing to live for that audience of one, and to say that he is first and best and most, and he's the most important thing in my life, there are going to be some people around you that don't understand that. Maybe they do understand it, and because they're not in that same place, they'll seek to criticize you. If they can discourage you, because you know what? A life lived for Jesus is convicting. It's convicting. I mean, those wise men in Babylon, every time they watched Daniel go by, they were probably mad just because of what he represented. And so it is when we live our lives that way, our very lives would be a testimony, but also is a source in which conviction comes on those other. And people don't like that. And so what they do is they begin to criticize and they begin to attack us for living our life that kind of way. As as this woman is pouring this expensive perfume out upon Jesus, guess what the disciples are doing? Do you know what they said? Look at verse 8. But when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? Can you imagine? Here is someone that's offering their best to Jesus, and there are people that would criticize that, that would say that's wasteful, that he does I mean, what's implied there? He doesn't deserve it? That that's too frivolous? You know, everything about our God talks about a love that he lavishes upon us. All of the things that God gives to us, well, I got news for you, you don't deserve that. But he does. He deserves the best that you have to offer. In fact, I can't even believe, I mean, it might, it might make sense if it said the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw it, they were indignant. But this is his disciples. These are those who knew him best. They should have loved him most. They should have watched that woman and go, wow, I wish I could have done that. That's what we find. They called it a waste. This act of worship. This gift given to Jesus to prepare him. It's very clear. To prepare him for burial. You know what that says to me? You know, these, this is just days, hours before Jesus is going to be turned over. And in a mockery of a trial, he's going to be beaten and whipped and stripped and spat upon, and all of that. I would like to think that this fragrant oil that was poured, about, poured out upon our Jesus in this act of worship for the next several hours, it was a constant reminder in, in the Savior's nostrils that there is a love directed to Him. That there is someone that was willing to give their best. When all the disciples fled and ran, hid, and all of that, as they blindfold him, was he overwhelmed with the fragrance of that gift? I would like to think so. I would like to think that as he hung upon the cross, depending on which way the wind was blowing, he was reminded of that gift that act of worship. You know, the disciples weren't usually wrong. But here, they got it wrong. Giving your best for Jesus is never a poor use of your resources. There are some that don't understand. As a pastor, 
some of the things that I want to do in the church. They would say, there's a cheaper way to do church than what we're doing. And the answer to that is, yes, there is. But everything we do reflects the worship of God. Everything that we have is for God. I don't believe God's house ought to have holes in the roof. Holes in the parking lot. Holes in the walls. Holes in the carpet. All of that. You know, can we, can we do things cheaper? Yes. But why would we want to? This is, this is all in how we give ourselves. We as a church model what we as Christians ought to do. You, you know that. We in a community are a family. And we want to do things in a family that help model what individually we should do as a family. I want you to know that when you follow Jesus and you give him your best, you're going to be criticized. But let me tell you something else that I think is kind of interesting. You know what the chief characteristics of a critic is? When the woman was pouring the vial of ointment upon Jesus, what were the disciples doing? Come on, say it. You know it. What were they doing? Nothing. Nothing. They were literally doing nothing. They were just watching what she was doing, but they were doing nothing. They were doing nothing in an act of worship. They were doing nothing. And that's what critics do. Critics do nothing. But when they see others do something, you know what they do? They criticize. That is one of the chief characteristics of a critic. The most critical people I know are those that do nothing. But they'll be quick to condemn. They'll be quick to criticize what others are doing. One of my favorite stories, um, you know, kind of throughout history, is uh, Dwight Moody. Dwight Moody is, is talking to some of his parishioners. And, you know, D Dwight Moody was a soul winner. He believed in preaching the gospel. And one day, a lady comes to him and says, you know, Dw Elder Moody or Pastor Moody, whatever, he says, you know, I don't like the way you do evangelism. And his response is, well, tell me how you do it. And she says, I don't do it. And he says, I like the way I do it more than the way you don't do it. Whatever you offer, there are going to be some that criticize. There are going to be, what, in even your service, I've seen so many people, they want to give something, and so they give of their time, and they work, and they give, and they sacrifice, and they do something. And somebody comes along and criticizes what they've done. And, it, and it's hard. It's hard to live through that criticism. But I tell people, don't let someone. I find people that are busy, people that are doing something, they don't criticize others, even if it's not done in the same way that we might do it. We celebrate that. That's what we want to do. We want to give our best to Jesus. And sometimes your best maybe isn't as good as someone else's best, but if it's the best that you have, that's all that matters. So don't worry about the criticism. Here's the third key idea that I want you to notice in this story, and it's this. He is worth your attention right now. You know, Jesus said something in the story that's often been misunderstood, and worse, it's used uh, really in, in a way that's negative. It's in verse 11. In response to them saying, hey, this was a waste. Uh, verse 11 says, for you have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. You know, some would say, we always have the poor, why bother? The fact is, we're commanded to minister to the poor. We're to do that. In fact, just a few chapters earlier, we read, when you do that, you do that to me. Jesus says, that is one of the ways you serve me, is by serving other people, by blessing other people. And when you've done it unto the least of them, you've done it to me. When you go visit someone, you're visiting Jesus. When you're feeding someone that's hungry, you're feeding Jesus. Even if they were to throw it in your face, it doesn't matter. because you offer that to Jesus. 
you know, people ask me all the time, Pastor, don't, aren't you concerned what church does with money? I mean, I mean, you know, we have to hold them accountable. And therefore, until the church does exactly what I want with all the money, I'm not going to give money. I'm not going to give my tithe because I don't agree with this or that or whatever else. You, you don't understand the concept of giving. You don't give to a church. You don't give to a denomination. You don't give to a specific organization when it comes to the church. When you give, you give to Jesus. That's why when you offer service and somebody criticizes, you don't have to take it that. You can let it wash right over you. Don't let it bother you. You know why? Because what you did, you did for Jesus. And He acknowledges it. He knows. He receives it. He's honored by that. So don't let that criticism wear you down. And so some would say, uh, you know, there'll always be poor. Why bother? You know, the fact, the point that she is commended is because she was willing to do something now. She showed her love for Jesus. Not some point in the future, not some future date, but now. Listen, listen to what he said in verse 10. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a good work for me. And then verse 12. For in pouring out this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Look, I, I want you to know that if you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, you know what, in light of what I'm hearing, pastor's right. I'm not offering my best. I'm not giving my best. I will one day. That's where you went off the rail. It's not about in the future. It's not about someday off there. Do something now. That's what makes this story so powerful. It was spontaneous. I can imagine. She conceived the idea, the Holy Spirit, you know that oil that you have? Why not give it to Jesus? She meant it. She responded. I am, I, what an example it is. Because I can imagine if she hadn't done that, if she waited, if she chose not to, would she have brought that flask? to a tomb. And instead of offering it to a living Jesus, all that she could have done is offer it to the one who died. Give whatever you're going to give to Jesus now. Do you want to worship Jesus in a way that pleases him? Do it now. I love this. This is the way the NIV says it, that verse 10. Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing. The last hours of Jesus' life, I can't think of too many good things that happened. This one stands out. This lavish gift. This overwhelming gift. This woman gave to Jesus. I want to do that. I want to do that. I, I don't have a $20,000 vial of perfume. But I have a gift that Jesus wants even more than that. I have a gift that will honor Him in ways that will bring joy to His heart even now. And it is by giving my life to Him. By giving myself to Him. By yielding my life to Jesus. That will honor him. That's a beautiful thing. So I want to invite you to rise to your feet. We're going to sing a little hymn. Just a couple verses. It's one of my favorite because I'm not a great singer. But this, this often, I find it as I sing this in church, I'm finding myself singing it in the afternoon, singing it in the evening. Because... It is about loving Jesus. At the end of the day, being a disciple is about loving Jesus.
when we love Jesus with all of our hearts, wow, God is blessed by that. Jesus is honored. And so I hope today as we've talked about how do we love him more? How, how do we worship him better? It is a matter of the heart. Don't misunderstand what I've said. This isn't about you putting some dollars in the plate. This isn't about you guilting, being guilted and signing up for ministry somewhere. This is not about that. This is about listening to your heart and allowing the love of God to overwhelm you and to lead you to whatever it is that he wants for you. Will you sing with us as we close today? Jesus, I love thee, I know thy pride. For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. My gracious, sweet dreamer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus is now. I love thee. It is now. I hope today you've learned something about loving Jesus more. You know, in our Sabbath school class, we've learned that we will never be able to love God the way he loved us because his love towards us is undeserved. It's undeserved. It, we were not worthy. We were enemies, and he shows his love for us. And so our love will always come short, but yet, it's what God invites us to do is to return our love because of his love for us. As we close our service today, as you leave here, I hope that the love of God has become real to you today. That you understand that as a child of God, that's what God calls you to do is to show his love to him each day. Why not set your alarm clock a little early? Maybe not four. A little early, get up. Show your love for Jesus by spending time in his word. Be committed as a disciple of Jesus. Invite him into your life. Invite him to, to live his life through you. It is his will. The Bible says you're his body. He wants to show his love to others through you. So I hope today has been an encouragement. I'm going to stay right here at the altar. Maybe the baptism today touched your heart. And you know you need to make a decision like that. Maybe you've been baptized and you've wandered away. And today you're sensing, I need to talk to someone. I need to decide today, not to be baptized today, but to make a decision today to show our love for him. I want to invite you to come forward as, as people are going out. I just want to talk with you. I want to pray with you. I want to encourage you to love Jesus with all your heart. We're going to invite you as you leave. Our lunch is ready. Uh, we're going to ask that you kind of hold back and let our young people go through. they got a busy afternoon. And, uh, you know, they're young. They need to. Most of us wouldn't hurt. But there's enough. There's enough, but let them kind of go through and just be aware of what's going on and just enjoy 
enjoy the gift that God has given to us at this time, we have reason to rejoice today. I hope today you've seen a glimpse of God's love in a way you've never seen it before. And I wish that upon you, that he lavishes it all over you, that you will be immersed and washed in the love of Jesus. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the story, the story that is told about one who gave everything she had. She didn't do it because she wanted to earn your favor. She didn't do it to be seen of others. She did it because she loved you. And she couldn't help not doing it. Father, may the love of God transform us. May the love of God permeate our lives so that in everything we do, in everything that we do, would be a response to your love to us. Thank you for teaching us this morning and blessing us. I thank you for the people of God that are here. And Father, I thank you for the decisions that have been made here this morning to love you more, to love you better. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Remember lunch, and then if you want to go caroling, 4 o'clock today.